Welcome to season three of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. Season one was launched to help people through the pandemic by talking to a variety of experts about topics such as psychology, finance and health. Season two focused on more work-related issues, including HR, marketing and leadership. Now it is time for season three. Season three is centred on the IT industry, specifically tech startups. There are also career spotlights where I talk to senior IT people about the secrets to their impressive career journeys. My name is Nicholas Steele, founder of JJP Talent Solutions, an Australian IT recruitment company. For over 20 years, I've helped tech startups and innovative SMEs to attract, recruit and retain technical talent. I hope you enjoy listening. I'm delighted to introduce Stephanie Khalil. Steph is the founder of an early stage startup called Enroute App and is in the last cohort of the Activate program with River City Labs. Today, we're going to talk about the challenges of being an early stage startup founder and Steph's plans for the future. Steph, thank you for joining me on season three, episode four of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, Steph. Thank you. So, Steph, tell me a little bit more about your personal story and and how you've got to where you are today. Yeah, it's interesting when people ask that question, you sort of are made to sit back and reflect. But I guess I've always been a problem personality, if you can call it that, (laughs) otherwise otherwise known as an entrepreneur. (laughs) I was never really quite settled in the idea of, you know, there's a certain list of career pathways and that's sort of the set path for your life. Or as we would drive in the car, me and my brother were definitely the type of people to randomly come into conversation of, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this existed? Wouldn't it be cool if this existed and talk through that solution? So I guess you can say that it's always sort of been a part of the conversation of my life unknowingly. Um, But yeah, I I went to uni, did health sciences, ended up doing masters of international public health, went into the route of research and project management and business development, all in the community development, public health sort of sector. Um, But even during uni, I I had come up with this idea of of en route and alongside we're sort of trying to find my way through what it meant firstly to bring new tech into the world and what managing a startup or starting a startup would even look like. I was um, in, I think, my last year of my undergraduate or second year, something like that. And I was just working a casual job as a receptionist didn't even really know how to lodge my tax return, mostly because I wasn't earning enough to even lodge a tax return. (laughs) Had this idea and for three months was searching what to do with a startup idea. Well, actually, sorry, startup wasn't even a term, what to do with an app idea and spent two years just trying to immerse myself in different programs and definitely met a lot of interesting characters um, and ended up here, which I mean, timing is everything. And I think the experience that I've come to today has really um, been able to put me in a position now where I'm, I'm better suited to start a business and a tech business, no less. So I guess that is my story in a very condensed version. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I really love that story about you being a problem person, about constantly looking for new ideas and new ways of doing stuff and always asking why you were probably quite an exhausting child but (laughs) those (laughs) those kind of I've got two of my own that are a bit like that but that kind of constantly looking for new ideas and new ways of doing things yeah well I think my parents would argue that I haven't stopped being an exhausting child (laughs) yes I think I believe mine probably would as well Um, but in terms of en route, tell me a little bit more about en route and the app and and the whole purpose behind it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It didn't always start as a travel app. When I first had the idea, I was driving somewhere. My friend was ten minutes behind. She didn't know where to go up to a certain point. 
Um, and so I had to get on the phone and direct her and I was driving and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be so much more convenient if my route was just being left behind me and she could just see where I'm going because I'm a very visual person for me that would just be so much easier to follow and so there was this initial idea thrown out there of follow me within that same day um, it very quickly turned into something that I mean there was a realization that it wasn't going to be something for daily use um, and there's this thing called the GPS so if you know what the destination is called you can just plug it in <laughs> um, so I had this realization and my best friend was with me and we were talking about this and I travel quite a bit and I've always had the problem of not being able to really explain or show to someone exactly the journey that I've been through. You kind of arrive back after your holiday and people have pictures but can't really be bothered to piece together the journey and you usually respond with like, oh, yeah, my trip was good. Yeah, we saw so many amazing places. Personally, all of these stories would pop up in my head that I'd want to share, but it was just, it's too much. And you're never sure whether the person really was that invested in the answer. Yeah. <laughs> and so this quick way of being able to showcase your journey um, for me was really exciting. And as the company and the idea developed it turned into something that, you know, you could also easily convert into something that's bookable. So all of a sudden, this repeated process of planning and booking a trip that your friend has gone or that you've seen on social media that you're looking at and want to do, but don't know how to plan for and are really duplicating the entire process that that person has just been through is resolved as well. And I think having worked pretty much consistently throughout my whole life, it, time poor is definitely a burden that is carried for particularly for aspiring travelers or, or travelers in general where you have all these ideas of this trip that you want to do but you just don't have the time to sit there and commit to really planning your dream trip so all around for me it was um a, a dream solution product and I still have pictures of that night actually the day that I came up with the idea with my friend was sleeping over and just vigorously typing on Google what to do with an app idea and just getting all these development listings because startup wasn't even a term used. That's yeah. fantastic. I, I love traveling as well. Um, and just seeing, seeing the pictures and the whole route and, and everything. And it, do you do the journaling on there as well? Or is it just pictorial? Yeah, you can do if you want to do posts. But um, it is, it, I think the biggest realization I had actually recently was that we're sharing trips it could it could be a gap year and we're sharing it the same way that we share our morning coffee or our dinner or you know a, an event um which is so surreal if you think about yeah. it although I guess the fly in the ointments with regards to travel is is COVID yeah what impact is COVID having on your app or your plans with regards to on route? I've been pretty fortunate. Um, given all the circumstances this year, you would think travel would be directly implicated and it has. Um, but where we've had benefit is that we have an opportunity to actually bring awareness to local t tourism. Um, being able to map out a road trip through Queensland um, and even incorporating Indigenous tourism and more unique experiences. And once it's placed on a route that someone else can pick up and look at for they, them to also um, experience, all of a sudden those more unique travel experiences that maybe seem like a lot of effort to research are placed in a way that actually is a lot more accessible. But all of a sudden, you know, um, an Indigenous tour around Brisbane is something that you maybe not maybe wouldn't have searched for but it being placed in that route it's like oh yeah actually I really could do that and experience things in a different way or a jazz bar or an art class um, and different experiences that you maybe wouldn't have thought of placing in your journey that travel is very different and personal for different people but what makes that experience full is different for everyone and means something to everyone and so finding ways to include that in your travel journey I think is really interesting and something I've had a lot of fun trying to incorporate into what the sort of routes can encompass on on route and and be ready for people to pick up and and do themselves which is quite 
it's been quite good actually <laughs> yeah definitely and it doesn't have to be a gap year traveling around the world it could be a day off traveling around mm. Brisbane as you say and doing something different and yeah we we are very lucky living in Queensland that I mean for example in July I went to Noosa August went to Surfers Paradise uh, last weekend I just got back from a trip to Fraser Island so there are yeah. we we can travel it's just we can't get on a plane uh, really so I guess when the world opens up again um, there's gonna be so many opportunities en route it will be be fabulous totally and I mean I was talking to a potential partner the other week um, who's a caravan retailer in Queensland and they've done more than 10% of the sales that they had last year already just from people wanting to buy a caravan and road trip and travel and experience Australia. Um, so people are definitely getting out there. I think the whole support your local movement has been almost beneficial in both parts for the businesses, but also I think it's the excuse or the enabler that a lot of Australians needed to just get out there as well. Awesome. And you, I first met you through River City Labs. Um, you were in the the last cohort so tell me a little bit more about your experience of the Activate program. Well, it's interesting because I've been in and out of River City Labs, um, attending events and things for a couple of years now. And I have heard about the different programs, but for whatever reason, never quite got into any of them. And, and this was brought to my attention pretty last minute and the whole thing happened quite quickly. Um, a friend of a friend saw it. I applied like the five minutes before closing, <laughs> got a call the next day, got an interview the next day, interview the next day after that. And then by the end of the week had got accepted and started the Monday following. So I was like, whoa, wow. Whoa, whoa. But <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit crazy. Um, and right before that, I was in a little bit of a lull, I have to admit. Um, I wasn't sure. I think what's really interesting about being a young person in an early stage tech startup is that you're never sure how much you need to take the next step. You know, you need investment for the tech, but you need the tech for the investment. And it's just this like weird cycle. And then at what point you need to have industry conversations is just another sort of thing. So you you almost feel like you have enough, but never enough at the same time. Um, so I, I was in this sort of like weird space where I didn't quite know what my next move is, or at the very least, I felt like I needed some sort of, I couldn't keep speaking to the wall I needed someone to respond and say yeah that sounds like a good plan so we were put with the three mentors Peter Laurie um Lou Jury and Pauline and so they were really really good about everything from the get-go they were very welcoming very um I think they I just felt a personal sense of like they were excited to be on the journey with us it definitely was a breath of fresh air a little bit. I think when you have a lot of network conversations, you always feel like it's a bit of a business exchange. Mm. But having that genuine push towards something good and, and how open they were with their network, I think was exactly the reassurance and sort of access to the industry that I really needed and, and gave me the confidence now to, now I can really see myself like quitting my job and it all happening. So yeah, I guess overall, my experience with the Activate program was really amazing. But like anything, it's how much you put into it. They would never push for mentor appointments with you weekly or anything like that. It was totally up to the startup founder. And so how much you get out of them is really up to you. Absolutely. And um, I think as well, with Pauline, Lou, Peter, they've been on the startup journey themselves, so they understand mm. what, what you're going through. So one piece of advice that you'd give to the next cohort is what you put in is what you get out. Is there any other advice mm. that you'd give to, to people that are joining the Activate program now and in the future? Yeah, I think other than that, and I guess part of the what you put in is what you get out is the headspace you have going into it. You're there to learn and you're there with the mindset of maybe there are things I should do differently or do more of, or maybe I'm not being honest with myself about how much I'm putting in certain areas or whatever it may be. But I think 
being open to criticism, but also being aware that mental whiplash is 100% a thing. You know, one mentor's perspective on a good approach compared to another mentor's perspective on a good approach for the same thing can be different. Um, and I guess I would say that if you you are the person that knows your company the best and knows what you want to achieve the best, um, and if you think that there's a decision that is going to go against the values that you want for your company and for yourself, then there is no harm in standing by that. But yeah, it definitely your your ego is going to get bruised, not even just within this program, but along the whole startup journey. Um, and knowing yourself and knowing when you need to sort of accept that and make a change within is important as well. Yeah. So be open to feedback, to criticism, but still be able to stand fast to your values, your vision, et cetera. So knowing which advice to accept and which maybe not to take on board. Yeah. And I guess depending how early you are on the journey. <laughs> yeah. You, like you'll make some mistakes with both of those things but yeah it's all a, a, a cycle of learning definitely definitely and we learn by our mistakes of course Steph so <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> well exactly um, I always say I've learned so much from my mistakes I might make a few more but um anyway back to you so what would you say are the main challenges uh, of being an early stage startup founder yeah, well, talking about making mistakes, <laughs> um, being in tech is really difficult, especially because of how, I wouldn't say especially because of how young I started, but it definitely brought some circumstantial challenges in the sense that I didn't have any money at all. I was probably just making enough to like buy meals when I went out every fortnight or something like I wasn't really making a lot at all. Um, and you haven't really been in the world enough to have started a network or know where to go to for that. Um, and so I ran into the cliche problems of like how to find your tech and how to fill the skill set gaps or how to, whether it's by someone else or how to fill the skill set gaps yourself. And how do I even get to a point where I learn enough to do all of that? And so I think skills and network, I would say, are the two biggest things um, in what makes a startup su successful other than, you know, your commitment and, and your work and, and honest work in making that startup happen. And so I think for an early stage startup, having been young and not really like having any of that starting from genuinely the ground up, like this was the beginning of my career in, in anything. So I definitely had a lot of challenges in that. I would say that in any kind of challenge, not to be so hard on yourself because you can, it is true. You do learn from mistakes. And I always, it's funny looking back because I always used to say, I'm watching all these people making mistakes. Like I'm determined to be the person that doesn't make that mistake. And then you end up in that <laughs> same place. And like the reason why so many people get into problems with botch tech in their first version is because they usually don't have enough money to get a good quality tech done up or they haven't met the right person that can do that for them. And these things take time and it, it takes you putting yourself out there and you learn more about people and you learn more about yourself. And so I think over time, it's kind of like, it's weird, but there's so much like crossover between dating and having a startup. It's so weird, but like <laughs> you really tend to like, develop an understanding about what you know about yourself and what you know about other people and how to make things fit to make your business work. And yeah, so I think challenge is a perspective thing. You're always going to make some good decisions, some bad decisions, some things are going to be timing. Um, but if you're working towards building a good team, filling that team with the skill set that you need and you have a plan and you have a future, challenges can just be minor setbacks, I guess. And I really like that analogy. Um, it's like dating, <laughs> which is quite interesting. So bad. You know, your first couple are like me. 
<laughs> well, you have to kiss a lot <laughs> of frogs <laughs> to, to meet your prince, uh, so to speak. So you were young, uh, relatively, exper- relatively inexperienced. I don't think you are from a tech background. Um, no, that was the other thing. Yeah. Um, and being a young woman, did that have more issues or was it just being young and um, not having that, that technical background as well? Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting topic, and I think it, it is talked about a lot. And I've had to delve deep. I guess when you are a young woman, and you you do notice things sitting across the table from a fifty year old man who is an investor, and already feeling a little bit young and inexperienced, and and you you do have this feeling of is he going to look at me like I'm just like some, the typical cliches of like, I'm going to be too emotional or too naive or too whatever is like a young female and, and just not being taken seriously. Mm. Um, and it does make you delve deep to say, am I, do I have a chance here? Or is me being a female something that is really impacting on my ability to have certain conversations or be seen in a certain way or um, whatever else. And I think to an extent it is true. I watch conversations with guys my own age with the same sort of people. And I don't know what it is between like guys where they're just able to have this like bro like conversation. And they're just like, there's just kind of like this established uh, ease And I don't know whether it's we because we put pressure on ourselves or, you know, the other way around that it just makes that so apparent. But I think, and throughout my whole life, even professionally, you're you're aware that people have this sort of idea that women make more emotional decisions. Mm. And so trying to, I will notice in a conversation with a man, I do try to come across a bit more grounded and logical and and have it more together if that makes sense because I don't want them to feel like I'm just this young girl that is gonna not make thought through decisions and I think as well it's probably six of one half a dozen of the other that there is a kind of bro culture to a certain extent but I think women put it upon themselves that they're questioning themselves as well and need to be a little bit more confident or be more confident in their approach. But I'm, I've got quite a few videos and articles that I'm writing about that very subject. So look out for those. Um, yeah, well, I think it's like, it's, it is a stigma, but at the same time, I would say to any female entrepreneurs, it may be the case with some people that you are being looked at as maybe a little bit more naive or, you know, can't handle themselves or will be swayed easily or like be affected more easily or sensitive or emotional, whatever it may be. And that's fine. But I mean, it's not fine, <laughs> but it's life to a certain extent. You're not going to change that conversation if that person is thinking that way already. Yeah. But what I will say is it's the same, you, you get the same response if someone I mean my platform is predominantly social initially before we bring in the booking platform and so there is no income until that second phase and I've had a lot of conversations with investors that don't get that there's value in in having that social platform free and that there should be an income earlier on and from their perspective that is a silly business decision I know the value in my product and I believe in in bringing that product to my customers in that way And so that's nothing to do with me being female. That's a perspective on what they view is a good business decision. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is there are always going to be people that you're sat with that like or dislike something about you and see that as a red flag, like or dislike something about your business and see that as a red flag. And I am completely of the opinion that you have a choice in firstly your resilience and how much you take that on personally. But also, if you see value in your company, you make a decision to not let that conversation affect you and say, well, that's just not the type of person that I'm looking for and is right for my business. And so I think regardless of whether you're female or not, yes, you might be in, I guess, be on this receiving end of maybe different sort of responses based on that. I do believe it's getting a lot better. And I personally haven't experienced a particular situation where... I've walked out thinking this is totally because I'm female, but 
regardless, you're going to have to wear some stuff and you're going to have to wear some pushback and criticism and not everything is something that you should take on board. Sometimes it's just a difference. So yeah, I think giving too much power to that is the reverse as well. Yeah, definitely. And I'm glad that you brought up about the the commercialization and the funding mm-hmm. of your startup as well, because that was my next question. How how are you funding your startup and, and what are your, your plans moving forward? Yeah, so it's been self-funded to this point, yeah. <laughs> which has been interesting, a little exhausting. I've been blessed that it can that I have been able to sustain it. Um, a little bit of help from family and friends pool, which I'm so thankful for as well. But I am going out for investment at the moment. So that's sort of the next step. So hopefully not too much longer. <laughs> Perfect. Um, And best of luck with that, because I know it is obviously hard work. And so for the next six to 12 months, what are the plans for En Route? Where where do you want it to be? Where do you want the app to be? Yeah, well, it's it's exciting at the moment. um, It is in development. Um, So we'll be getting a product out shortly. Um, Having some conversations with industry partners. And yeah, it's just all happening at the moment so hopefully in the next six to 12 months people will have the product in their hands and can be recording their travels and sharing their experiences and yeah starting to build a community that's fantastic I can't wait to see it all Mm. that's really brilliant yeah me too (laughs) and Steph what is your end goal where do you want en route to to really go it's funny because it's it has been a part of my life for a, for a long time, and I think it has a lot of potential with the booking system. Yes, but I come from a humanitarian background as well, and it's something that's very close to my heart. And I think the opportunity to leverage off the profit from the company and create opportunities for developing countries to access travel or partner with some non-for-profits in that space I think would be really interesting and exciting to explore that world the world is very different and travel was a luxury not that long ago and now it's just becoming more and more accessible and I think there's so much to learn from different cultures and and exposing yourself to different facets of life and how people live and um, it would be really I think when you have a lot it's always good to remember that by giving back I'm excited to explore how we can utilize that a little bit more. I absolutely love that, Steph. That's really, really brilliant. And yeah, travel is a luxury and you learn so much. And I think it makes you grow as a person, but also giving back. And you'll be delighted to know, um, I am a member of B1G1, which is about Mm. buy one, give one, and is about giving back. So by recording this podcast, uh, we're providing a month of e-learning for a school in rural India so um, just by talking Amazing. to me you, you, yeah. you're kind of some way getting to it's your started. yeah so that that domino effect so thank you very much thank you thank you so much for sharing your insights Steph is there anything else uh, that you'd like to share I think the only thing is that I know personally when I've listened to a lot of podcasts particularly in the startup space when you're having these conversations, it does sound like you have it all together a little bit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think I would say to anyone that is just feeling it right now, no one really has it all together. Everyone is just very, very good at looking like it. <laughs> and you definitely question a lot about yourself, a lot about your purpose, a lot about the business and, and your decisions and everything like that. I know it's a very cliche thing to say, but the people that you surround yourself with are so important and it can be the make or break with a lot of decisions you make personally or for the business. And and it's so important to make sure that you come back to looking after yourself because if you don't look after yourself, the the business isn't going to work. That's brilliant. Yeah. I guess that's all I have to say (laughs) about that. And it it is so true that you do need to, self-love is often the most difficult love to practice, but also about the people you surround yourself with. So, for example, being involved in the Activate program, you're surrounding yourself with the right people, but also your family and friends as well. Well, Steph, thank you very, very much. It's always a delight to talk to you. 
Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe, rate and review. If you're looking for career advice, your next career opportunity or to grow your tech team, then please call me, Nicholas Steele, on 499 773 546 or go to our website, jjptalent.com.au. The Don't Just Survive Thrive podcast is part of the Spotlight series, which includes the YouTube channel, Spotlight on Software Development. If you want more insights into the software industry, particularly tech startups, then subscribe to the Spotlight on Software Development YouTube channel. Thank you for listening. Until next time. Thank you.